Hi, I'm Raphael Chacon. I'm director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture and a professor of art history and criticism at the University of Montana in the School of Media and Visual Arts. And welcome back to our series on Roman and early Christian art. Um, before we begin our discussion, uh, I'm uh, letting you know that we're recording these and posting these on Zoom or recording them via Zoom and posting them on uh, my YouTube channel. So I wanna encourage you to subscribe to that channel to join me, Hippolito Rafael Chacon on YouTube. Um, also, please know that these lectures are free and, uh, and you're more than welcome to watch them and share them and encourage others to, uh, to enjoy them. Um, but also be aware that the, the structure of these lectures, that's content, the text, the images, are copyrighted materials. So if you need to actually copy these, I wanna encourage you to, uh, to reach out to me in writing and you can do that via email. Just contact me at the University of Montana and I would be happy to respond to you that way. So, um, so again, just, uh, just take note that uh, if you're thinking about copying or imitating these lectures that they are indeed copyrighted materials. The other issue I wanted to talk about before launching into our PowerPoint is talking about bibliography. One thing is true about uh, Roman studies as well as early Christian studies uh, and Byzantine studies, which is sort of the successor empire to the Romans in the Mediterranean basin, uh, is that these studies are very, very rich and the bibliography is extensive and it's vast and it's actually quite old. Um, so, um, so a number of you have written me about like what sources are good sources to use for Roman materials and for this history and particularly Roman art. And again, it's, it's hard to recommend one, uh, one title or one text because again, the bibliography is so, so vast and so dense and so uh, rich. There's lots of great sources. There's lots of great online sources about, uh, about the Romans and Roman art. Uh, Facebook alone has uh, countless numbers of, of groups dedicated to Roman art and history. Uh, so I wanna encourage you to, to use all those sources because there's a lot of good information out there. But I also wanna recommend a source, and this is a textbook that I have used repeatedly over the years in my art history classes. This is Fred Kleiner's, um, Fred S. Kleiner's A History of Roman Art. And this has gone through a number of different uh, reprintings. Uh, it's a beautiful book, it's beautifully illustrated as you can see, and it has wonderful charts and diagrams and maps. I love maps and maps are very instructive uh, to help locate us geographically when we study these materials. So again, a recommendation uh, to you on bibliography, Fred S. Kleiner's A History of Roman Art. So uh, if um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and open up the PowerPoint discussion for you. So here we go, and here is the presentation. So what we're doing um, uh, is now looking at the early history of Rome and with a particular emphasis on the development of the early Romans, but also looking at the city of Rome, the city proper. And so the, the focus on today's discussion will actually be on the urban development of the city as we know it. So we will obviously look at some representations some models of the earliest settlements, but then also jump to so that you can see how far that city evolved in its evolution as a, a major uh, center and certainly the capital of a vast and powerful empire. So again, to locate us geographically, here's this wonderful map with the Roman names, the Latin names for, um, for the, the world, the environment in which the, uh, the Roman state uh, developed. And again, I wanna point out that the important peninsula here, the all important peninsula for the Romans is the Italian peninsula. And that's that boot shaped um, um, uh, peninsula piece of land that projects down into the Mediterranean. Um, and then of course the, the stone that it seems to be kicking, the kicking stone is the famous island of, of uh, Sicily. And then surrounded by the, the various seas uh, surrounding that peninsula that the Romans uh, considered their backyard, their, their, their sea, il mare nostrum, as they, uh, as they called it. I wanna point out in this particular map that there is in fact a little 
river shown here, and that's the, uh, the, the river known as the Tiber River. And the city of Rome is almost at the end of that river uh, in the western uh, edge of the, the river when it uh, empties into the Tyrrhenian Sea um, to the west. Uh, Rome is not on the sea, it's actually uh, in the middle of the peninsula, but it's on the Tiber River. And as the ancient Romans used to say, all roads lead to Rome, because they indeed saw this great capital as the hub, if you will, of their vast empire. And they did build, in fact, phenomenal roads that extended uh, far from, uh, far out into the farthest reaches of the empire. But indeed, all those roads did converge on that spot that you see there in that diagram on the left, and that map on the left, uh, known as the city of Roma, or the city of Rome. And here on this map, you do see the Tiber River snaking through towards the southwest, ultimately emptying out in the Tyrrhenian Sea. And Rome did have a port city, and that is the city of Ostia. And um, so there is, a, there is a port where the Roman Empire used, and of course the ships would sail up and down that would navigate the Tiber River from the city proper to the port of Ostia. But then you can also see on the right side in the diagram on the right, the, the roads that led to Ostia. There's the Via Ostiensis, the, the, uh, or the Via Portuensis, either the city that led to Portus, the port, or the, or the road that led to Ostia, the city. The, fame, the most famous ro uh, Roman road is the Via Appia, a road that headed to the south from, uh, from the city proper. So these were paved roads, uh, quite a feat of engineering for the ancient cities, uh, where its carts and its traffic and its business uh, all, uh, and its military uh, used, it, uh, used these roads to, to get around. Um, so, um, what you're looking at here on this screen is a kind of a, it's a, a history, a brief history of uh, uh, the Roman, the development of the Roman capital city from its earliest uh, days, its infancy as, um, as a series of, of tribes on these seven famous seven hills, all the way to the, it's, the, its abandonment as the capital city in the year 330 under the emperor Constantine. Uh, so what, what we know from uh, Roman historians and others was that, the, um, that the, the roots of Rome are murky. In fact, they often told us that they, they began in kind of mythology or ancient myths. But most historians and archaeologists tell us that it actually began as a series of Iron Age huts um, on, uh, on hills uh, on the edges of the, uh, of the Tiber River, sometime in around the mid-8th century BC. We know that by that, the middle of that century, there was in fact a, a series of kings that ruled these villages on these hills. There were seven kings uh, who ruled, and the first of those kings was known as Romulus. And of course, Romulus is a figure from uh, Roman mythology. To what extent he was a real personage versus a mythological cr uh, creature, we don't know. But most historians believe that there might in fact been a king who ruled sometime around the middle of the eighth century BC. Uh, before the Common Era named Romulus. And then the Etruscans, those people who lived to the north, conquered those villages and they ruled in the 7th century to the 6th century BC. And uh, there was a dynasty known as the Tarkins. Uh, and those people are the ones who built things like the Roman Forum or created the Circus Maximus, the great circus where horse and chariot races took place. They also built the great sewers of Rome. We, we give credit to the Romans for having built those things, but those were actually Etruscan constructions. Uh, and the first walls of Rome were not built by the Romans. I mean, they might have been Roman labor, but it was actually the Etruscan design and Etruscan rulership that controlled the construction of those major, major aspects of the Roman city. Uh, the Roman city end, or the Etruscan rule ended with, with the establishment of the Republic by Lucius Junius Brutus, and then a series of wars commenced between that Republic and the Etrurians to the north and the neighbors to the east and south. Uh, ultimately, Rome becomes imperial, becomes imperialistic, begins to conquer and colonize uh, the neighbors on the Italian peninsula, and then going a, a, a sea and conquering um, rival empires like the Carthaginians in the third uh, and second centuries BC. 
And then, of course, the, the history of Rome that, we, that is familiar to us in the Western world really kicks in when Rome becomes, in fact, not just imperialistic, but also ruled by an individual rather than ruled by a republic or as a republic. And uh, Julius Caesar is the first tyrant um, to, uh, to a mass rule in, under one person, a, what the Romans called the primus inter pares, or the first among equals. And it's Caesar and his descendant, Augustus, uh, who will then commence this whole uh, imperial rule under a Caesar, under a, a single ruler, a tyrant, or a king, if you want to use that term. So then there's, of course, a, a long series of Rome under uh, the tyranny of kings. And um, that, that rulership then becomes divine rulership as the, these kings are divinized as gods. And of course, there's a long lineage of those kings, which we'll study later in this, uh, in this course. Um, and then it climaxes with uh, Constantine in, in the fourth century. And Constantine changes many, many things in, in Roman society. He, uh, uh, um, he makes Christianity a legal religion first, and then he makes it the state religion. Uh, and then ultimately what he does for Rome is a fatal uh, decision, and that is to transfer the capital out of the city, uh, excuse me, the capital from Rome proper, from the Western Empire to the east and establishes a new city called Constantinople, the city of Constantine, um, which he establishes in 330, leaving Rome a kind of power vacuum there, which for another 100, 150, 200 years will make it a very unstable place. And ultimately it will fall to what were then known as barbarian hordes from the north. And uh, north, tri uh, tribes from Northern Europe, Central Europe will come down into the Italian peninsula and will fill that political void left uh, by Constantine and the Roman state. So that's a kind of a nutshell history of the Roman, um, the Roman uh, empire and the development of that empire. But for our purposes, we're gonna focus on the early days of how that state came into being and how Rome became the powerful, the center of power that it became. So two maps showing you, in fact, Rome, the location of Rome and its neighbors. So again, look to the map on your left, and there you can see uh, between the yellow and the, and the green there, between the Etruscans and the Latins is, in fact, the Tiber River. And that's flowing uh, towards the southwest, towards the, uh, the, the front of the Italian boot. Uh, the western side, and it's there that Rome, be, from there that Rome begins to conquer its neighbors. So initially it's conquered by the Etruscans to the north. Eventually when the Romans come into their own sense of power, they will conquer to the north, the Etruscans to the north, the Latins to the south, and then the other Italic peoples to the east, north, and south of, the, of that uh, Italian peninsula. So there are some of, the, some of the tribes that they conquered, the Ligurians, the Venetians, the Umbrians, the Campanians, the Apulians, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and here is a, a map actually that shows you how that, uh, that happened in time. So you have there Rome is that, uh, that purple dot in kind of in the center. And to the south, what is ringed in blue are the, the land of the Latins. The people, the Latium, they spoke this language called Latin, which was the language of the Romans. To the north in green is the land of the Etrurians or Etruria, the Etruscan lands. And again, all the dots that you see there on this map in green are Etruscan settlements. And there were in fact Etruscan settlements all around Rome. So much so that the Etrurians, the Etrurians actually, the Etruscans actually conquered Rome and created new settlements there. But eventually the Romans will have their, uh, the last laugh because they will conquer the lands north and south and east of them. Um, with some of the other neighboring tribes, and we talked about some of these, the Samnites, for example, to the south and east of, of Rome. Uh, we talked about them in our first lecture. So um, this, was not a, uh, this was not a simple process. It took centuries for Rome to do this, um, about 300 years. But in, in about 300 years, Rome had risen and had in fact conquered the entire peninsula and then expanded the empire well beyond the boundaries of the Italian peninsula. So uh, that map on the right shows you that Rome first expanded to the, immediately to the north of the Tiber River and then, it, and then to the south, and then continued on with Etruria and 
crossing the Apennines to the east and uh, and then uh, and then moving continuing to move south into uh, into the, uh, the the heel of the boot and the tip of the boot and into Sicily and beyond. And here's another map of the Mediterranean basin. Here it shows you how um, um, how Rome expanded well beyond the Italian peninsula to the Hellenic Peninsula to the east, and then to Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey today, moving to the west uh, to Hispania, which be, uh, the uh, Iberian Peninsula, which became Spain, Portugal, um, that part of their empire as well. And then ultimately into France, ancient Gaul, into, nor into Northern and Central Europe as well, uh, conquering Europe, but also conquering Africa and the, the, the Near East uh, as well. Uh, the Roman Empire was vast. And, and of course, they used the Greek Empire, the Hellenistic Empire, as their model. Uh, and they wanted not only to conquer those lands, but to go even beyond what the Greeks had conquered before them. So you see these two maps show uh, Roman expansion, uh, both during the Republic and then during the period of the, uh, the, the rule by the Caesars. Okay, so here's another map showing you many, many sites, including uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the, uh, the British territories uh, also conquered and ruled uh, from Rome uh, and going as far east as uh, the Black Sea and the territories, the land surrounding the Black Sea uh, in Asia Minor. And here's another wonderful map that shows us the, the, all the different regions of the Roman Empire. I mean, this is uh, over 50 of them. Uh, they were all in, in various times in Roman history consolidated into large blocks that were ruled by, uh, by, uh, by generals, Roman generals, or descendants of the, of the Caesars or appointed appointees of the Senate and the, uh, and the, Roman, uh, the Roman state. Um, for example, here you can see Spain there in, or Spain and Portugal, the Hispanic Peninsula on the far west there uh, at this particular moment, uh, which I believe is in the fourth century um, uh, AD, uh, Spain actually had three regions um, um, that you can see on this map. So again, the heart of the Roman state for most of the, of the history of the Roman Empire was of course the capital city of Rome. And again, I bring you these maps that we saw earlier in the discussion that, and all of the roads. And these were the roads that were used in fact to maintain order across the empire. So the army, the military moved across these roads, goods and services moved along these roads, ideas uh, moved along these roads to connect the city to its vast empire. And then of course, there was also maritime travel. So imagine these roads ending at major ports. Some of those ports were ancient Greek ports. Some of them were ancient Phoenician ports, Carthaginian ports, et cetera, Egyptian ports. Those eventually become succumb to the Roman state and become major Roman ports as well. So the Romans will add a layer of their civilization, their control and jurisdiction on those uh, major port towns as well. So this is a wonderful map. It's a, a, a over 100 years old. This is an, a, a very old map, but it shows us, in fact, Rome before the city expanded and became the capital city. And what it shows us are, in fact, the famous seven hills of Rome. Starting from the top, you see the Quirinal Hill, and then the Viminal Hill, and the Esquiline Hill, the Cellian Hill, and the Palatine Hill, uh, and the Aventine Hill. One thing to notice about this map is you see the river flowing there to the south, the Tiber River snaking on the left side of that map. The seven hills are all on the right or to the east of the Tiber River. There is another hill on the other side of the river known as the Janiculum. That western side of the Tiber was not, uh, was not Rome. That was what the Romans uh, called Trastevere, on the other side of the Tiber, the Tiber River. There's another famous hill uh, just north of that, known as the Vatican Hill. And of course, even today, the Vatican is not in Rome. It is its own, ci it's its own city state outside the city of Rome, surrounded by Rome, but it is not in Rome. Uh, it has never been Rome. It has always been on the other side of the city um, of the Tiber River and therefore outside the boundaries of Rome. 
but it is indeed these seven hills that defined the city of Rome. And imagine in ancient days, those cities having villages on them. And the villages were strategically located on tops of those hills because what was below, what was in the valleys was in fact, uh, were swamps, uh, marshes. And those marshes were not a place where humans uh, could, live quite, could live comfortably. There were mosquitoes, there was malaria, there were all kinds of problems. They used those swamps, they tended animals down there and they, uh, and they went down there and they farmed those things, but they actually lived on the hills. And by the way, the original tribes of ancient Rome were not exactly friendly to each other. These villages that were on these hilltops were in fact often rivals of each other. They, we know that they intermarried, we know that they shared, uh, um, uh, they had families, uh, but they also warred against each other. There's lots of evidence that these early hill towns on these seven hills were in fact often at war with each other, but eventually they confederated. And the Etruscans unified them sort of uh, when they ruled them, when they had uh, kings based here that in fact ordered the, the locals around. But this gives you a sense, these uh, wonderful reconstructions show you what these very humble rustic villages were like on these seven hills. And the common land was actually in between the hills. So, and often the, the villages were stockaded so that to prevent you know, uh, marauders and enemies from entering them. And that's a tradition that will also continue in, uh, in, as the city develops. Um, so uh, these are models and drawings of what, uh, what historians and archaeologists uh, uh, believe the ancient settlements look like. Quite rustic, round huts with thatch roofing, quite mean if you think about the, the kind of spaces. And there's lots of archaeological evidence of these ancient uh, pre-Roman pre uh, or pre-Etruscan uh, 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 villages in, um, in central Italy. Uh, here's some more of uh, these models are from the, uh, the, the, uh, the Museum of the City of Rome that has these wonderful models of, of the earliest settlements in, uh, in the city. And there are in fact some reconstructed villages, um, these pre-Roman villages in uh, throughout Italy and throughout Western Europe, uh, showing us you know, very, very humble um, uh, structures. This is the inside of a kitchen area where you see that humble little stove in the corner and some of the ceramics that were used. Of course, wood fire was, uh, was the, the heating source, but also the, the, the cooking fuel, the cooking source. Um, and then eventually that site with the swamps and the hills becomes the city that you see below in that model, in that beautiful model, also in the, uh, the, uh, the city of Rome's uh, museum. So, um, uh, so it was a, a, an unbelievable development from these very, very rustic uh, ways of life to the kind of opulence and the grandeur and the magnificence of the Roman imperial capital. So I want to uh, briefly point out that the spot that is highlighted here in, this, um, in, this, in the model with that bridge and the, the square in front of it is also a very important place in the development of Rome. And it's where the river meets this, uh, the, where it bends here in the, at the heart of this map that you see there. Uh, there was a, there's a place there known as the, Vela, uh, the Velabrum uh, and a forum, the Forum Boar, Boarium. And the Forum Boarium was the cattle market. And it's there that historians believe was the most important site for these ancient villages. And here's another, um, another uh, diagram showing us that, that site. The Velabrum was, in fact, this area where, uh, where water, the marshes sort of uh, became rivers that came down and joined the Tiber River to the west. There was a lowland here, a low plain, below the Palatine Hill and the Capitoline Hill. And it was in that plain where the capital market was, or the cattle market, the Forum Boarium was. And there, that was a very special gathering place where they traded cattle, where the cattle were placed on boats and transported up and down the Tiber River. So imagine all that tending of animals took place out a field in the peninsula, in the marshes, beyond the marshes, and that those animals were gathered here and then traded, sold, and shipped uh, via the Tiber River. So that's a very important part in the history of Rome. And, uh, and here's another beautiful uh, map. This is a very early map where we see, in fact, here's the Palatine Hill, the Capitoline Hill, and between them, this kind of swampy lowland. And at one point, it was in fact a kind of a divot where, the, where, uh, where streams and rivers and the marshes flowed into the Tiber River. 
eventually that silted up and it became a kind of plane. And on that plane was in fact where the cattle markets were established. There were other low lying lakes here. For example, there's a lake to the south, actually more than that. And another large, very large one over in what eventually becomes a silted up field known as the campus marshes, um, the military fields for the Roman uh, state. Um, but anyway, here are the major hills, as you can see, to the east of the river, and the Velabrum and the, and the cattle market was one of those important places for those villages, uh, those hilltop villages to gather. And again, here's another map, uh, a map on the right, and then a model on the left showing us that open uh, market uh, that continued to be a market even into, uh, into the imperial times as well. Um, this, it's he easy to spot some of the, the important monuments of the later uh, Roman state, like the Circus Maximus right here, the great circus where the races uh, took place. This is the Palatine Hill where the, uh, the royal palaces, in fact, our word palace derives from the original name, the Latin name for that hill, the Palatine. Uh, and so palace uh, comes, derives from Palatine. So the center of power where the royal palaces were located. The Capitoline Hill is just opposite it here on the map on the other side of the Velabrum from the Palatine. And the, our word capital, for example, derives from the name, uh, the Latin name for head, the top hill, the tallest hill, the caput. And so the Capitoline Hill was where the Romans eventually built their major temples to their major gods. So the Temple of Zeus, the Temple of Jupiter were located on the top of the Capitoline Hill. So centers of power, centers of governance for these, uh, these, these tribes that united or, or were artificially banded into a confederation which eventually becomes the Roman state. So again, here's the Velabrum with the cattle market, the Forum Boarum, Boarium, excuse me, and then eventually bridges were built across the Tiber, as you can see here, leading us to the other side, Trastevere, to the other side of the Tiber. Uh, but the city proper developed on these hills on the other side, uh, on the eastern side of the Tiber River. There is, by the way, another very important lowland just on the other side of the Palatine Hill and the Capitoline Hill before you hit the other important hills that converge here. And that open space is a sacred space for the Romans. And that is in fact the Roman Forum. And so we'll talk more about how that area is later developed in, uh, uh, by later peoples. But while we're still here at the, uh, at the Velabrum and at the Forum Boarium, the, the cattle market, I just wanna show you one of the most ancient temples. This was a temple of Portunus, a god of ports. Uh, it was formerly known as the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, the, the uh, the, the, for, uh, the a god that protected male power, male virility, if you will. Uh, but that's an old name, it's an old designation. We now know that this little temple, which is still there today on the forum, on the cattle market, this little temple was dedicated to the god of the port, uh, the god of Portunus. In fact, this is what that temple looks like today. It's actually, the area has cleaned up quite a bit since this photograph was taken. But you see it, it's a, it's a, it looks to us like a Greek temple because many aspects of this building are uh, indeed very Grecian. They look very Greek or Hellenic, but it's actually a Roman temple. It's up on a high plinth. It has a grand staircase leading up to it. Um, there's some modifications of the architecture here that tells us this is a Roman building. And if you want to see what that building looked like in Roman times, all you need to do is travel to Nîmes, France. And there in the central square of Nîmes, France is a beautiful Roman temple, very similar to the temple at, uh, at, um, at, in the Velabro and the temple in Rome. And this is this temple, the, Maison, the French call it the Maison Carré. And this building is virtually intact uh, since it was built in, um, in the first century uh, BC. So, um, so in that, actually the last decade of that millennium. So it's a beautiful, beautiful building, a very, very important building in the development of uh, architecture in the Western world, imitated countless times across uh, from Russia to the United States. It's a very, very important uh, architectural style, uh, this uh, Roman temple from the first century BC. Um, this is what the Roman temple looked like in the 17th century. At the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century, uh, the temples were in ruins. There were still some columns around. Uh, lots and lots of buildings had been built over the Middle Ages. 
all of this began, this process of destruction began uh, when Rome collapsed and arguably when Constantine abandoned the city in the fourth century BC. So imagine 1500 years later, this is what the ancient Roman capital looked like in this uh, print by the famous Piranesi, the Italian uh, artist. Uh, so it was virtually a ruin, still inhabited, still used, still an open space for the most part, but not what it was uh, during the imperial uh, uh, period. That area, the Roman Forum, is here. So the view that I just showed you was a view looking that way, uh, looking to the north on the Roman Forum. This is where the major Roman temples were located. So imagine the Palatine Hill being here where the Roman palaces, the palace of the Roman emperors was located, the capital where the Roman state, the government was located. The, the forum here is the lowland to the west, right along the edge of the river. And then the city itself, and then immediately to the east of the Capitoline and the Palatine was this low marsh, which was ultimately drained by the Etruscans when they built the sewers. It then became habitable, um, malarial free zone, if you will. And it was there that the Romans built their major fora, their open spaces. They built their basilicas, these very large halls, and they built their temples. And it was, and through that space, by the way, is where the, through the middle of that low uh, plain, through that forum, was in fact the Via Sacra. And I'll show you that later in, in other maps. This was the holy way where processions uh, paraded through from one end, from the south to the north, to the Capitoline Hill, allowing priests and attendants and sacrifice, sacrifices uh, to, to take place uh, and to honor the gods and to bring the state and the people together. And then of course, surrounding that on the eastern side, north and south, east and sides of that uh, plain are the hills, the Quirinal, the Viminal, the Esquiline, the Chelian, the hills that were once the seats of those earlier villages. And before we leave this, uh, this map, I want to show you that, in fact, um, the Romans also began to, uh, to surround their city with walls. So they surrounded those seven hills and sometimes took those walls across the river as well um, to protect the hills opposite of the communities that lived on the other side of the Tiber. So the walls then become an important element in the life of the city as it develops, as it unifies under a central rule. This is that wonderful model that is in the uh, Museum of the City of Rome that shows us that what the city looked like at its apogee in the fourth century, just before the Emperor Constantine moves the capital away. So I just wanna again point out the most significant monuments on, uh, on um, presented here. This is the Circus Maximus, and the royal palaces were all here to the east overlooking the circus. So they had front row seats, if you will, um, looking down onto the stadia of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the circus, where they could watch the races from their windows and from their porticos and their beautiful, um, their beautiful palace uh, halls. Uh, there, were other, uh, uh, there were other important buildings like the theater that you see here. There were bridges across the Tiber on the Capitoline Hill, great temples. Here's the Temple of Zeus, other important structures that were important for the government governance. And then what you can hardly make out by the fourth century is that plain, that valley that used to exist before the next set of hills starts. And that is the Roman Forum. The Via Sacra, the holy route, Winds, winds through past these temples and basilicas up to the Capitoline Hill with its temples. So there were other temples, the, the House of the Vestal Virgins, other important buildings, other important basilicas, and the forums built adjacent to it by the Roman emperors, various a succession of Roman emperors. Uh, important structures like the Colosseum, otherwise known as the, uh, the Flavian Amphitheater, other important palaces, other important temples, and aqueducts bringing fresh water, in the case of this one here, bringing fresh water to 
the palace from the neighboring mountains. So remember, the Romans didn't drink the water from the Tiber because it was filthy. They drank water from uh, hillside and mountain site, uh, sites, and that water had to be moved here by way of these enormous engineering feats known as aqueducts. So it was a very, very impressive city in the fourth century. It continued to be for the next 200 years uh, until those barbarian invasions, until the city actually ultimately collapsed uh, from the power vacuum. Here's another uh, diagram showing you again, the Roman Forum uh, here with the Via Sacra wending its way through the Capitoline here to the, uh, in this case, it's actually to the north, but it's on the left side of this diagram. And here's the Palatine Hill with its, uh, its, its pa uh, palaces, the palaces of the Roman emperors and the Circus Maximus below. And then down below that, uh, along the edges of the river is the Forum Boarium, again, the cattle market. Uh, so these fora that you see here, and a fora, by the way, just means open space, like a plaza. So you have the Roman Forum, which was no longer an open space because it had been built up by so many additions. Um, but then to the north are new fora, and these are fora of various um, uh, Roman emperors. For example, the Forum of Augustus, the Forum of Nerva, the Forum of Vespasian, the Forum of Caesar, the Forum of Trajan, etc., etc. Again, these are open spaces, but often articulated with colonnades and sometimes holding temples, libraries, basilica, very important buildings for the, uh, the Roman people and the Roman state. Okay, this is what the Roman Forum looks like today. In fact, it look, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a remnant, if you will, of uh, what was once a highly popular, highly populated uh, space. So initially it was an open space, a marshland which was drained, and then over a succession of centuries, the Romans would build their temples and they would build basilicas, large halls, of which here the only thing that is left is the foundations, the staircases and some of the, uh, the column, the, the, the platforms for those columns. The columns themselves are gone, looted, destroyed. These buildings were burned, destroyed, uh, ravaged uh, over the course of centuries. Um, but this gives us a sense of how thickly built up the Roman Forum was uh, by the fourth century. Um, and it included not just basilicas and temples, it also included things like monuments like this triumphal arch that you see here at the northern end, just below the Capitoline Hill. So this became a very, very densely uh, populated, urbanized, uh, built, uh, built up uh, space. Again, here's the same uh, archway that I just showed you with its neighboring temples. In most cases, the buildings are all gone. All we have are these remnants of the temples, a colonnade here that just points to the facade of what was once a very large temple. And the Capitoline Hill itself, even though it looks built up today, it is built up today, it sits on the ruins of Roman buildings, Roman temples uh, themselves. And it, has, it continues to be a seat of gover government, a seat of power for the Roman uh, uh, peoples. This is what that Roman, this is what the, the Capitoline Hill looked like in antiquity with, uh, with the earliest temples or earliest structures built on it. Eventually they will build massive temples on it and they will, uh, and the plaza, the Roman forum in front of it will be successively built up. Monuments will be erected on that um, important uh, site for the Romans, a sacred site for the Romans, but also a political site because it's here underneath these uh, stoa, these arcades, these uh, porticos is where the Roman people gathered and they negotiated and they haggled and they uh, debated laws and they debated and they, they had elections and they, uh, uh, it was, this was the civic space of Rome. This is the view that I just showed you to the north. Actually, let me backtrack very briefly. This view, uh, this is what uh, art historians in the 19th century proposed that view to have looked like. Uh, again, that's the Capitoline Hill here with major structures that serve the Roman state. And then below it, a series of temples and arches and staircases leading up to the Capitoline Hill. Um, there's in the foreground here is a very important structure. This was known as the rostrum. Um, and the rostrum uh, had actually the rostra, the, the prows of uh, ancient ships. 
as monuments, as trophies of Rome's uh, maritime and imperial battles, its victories actually. And there were columns and monuments set up here. And on that rostrum is where people orated, important politicians, emperors gave discourses and spoke to the Roman people gathered in the Roman Forum. There's also one other really important little monument, and that's this little structure that you see here. It's this conical uh, form, and that's also very important in the history of ancient Rome. And let me point out that that rostrum uh, changed shape over the course of centuries. So here we see not only is the area being built up with different temples, but the rostrum itself will be reconfigured uh, depending on the needs. Actually here, you can actually see little rostrums from the ships, the, the prows of those ships, uh, that were actually located as trophies on the front of this podium that the uh, Roman emperors and their spokespeople used to address the Roman people. But again, let me point out that little conical structure that you see here in the third century AD. Uh, and that structure looks like this today. It's just a pile of bricks. Uh, and there is in fact, part of that conical form is up on top here. You see the cylindrical part up on top. And then there is in fact a chamber underneath this. And this is known as the sacred umbilicus. This is the navel, and here it again in this, uh, in this uh, digital reconstruction. And by the way, there are a number of digital reconstructions online uh, and you can access them. Um, uh, a number of wonderful, wonderful places where you can actually see uh, Rome reconstructed uh, uh, digitally uh, and enhanced to, to make us uh, believe that we're actually there uh, in the third dimension. Anyway, here is the umbilicus, that little structure uh, just behind the Roman rostrum. And this is a very, very important little structure for the Romans because this umbilicus was believed to be the, the, the place, the foundational place for the ancient city of Rome. Notice that it was not on one of those hills. It's actually below in the forum itself. So this was a central place. And this is known as the cave of the wolf. And this is, according to mythology, this was the cave where the she-wolf uh, nurtured, suckled Romulus and Remus. Uh, so again, going back to the mythologies, so the Romans marked a spot where they believed that myth took place, and they marked it with this umbilicus, to use that term, right, the birthplace, if you will, of of the ancient city. And by the way, the Roman Forum is dotted with uh, famous places like that. And, and, the, and this idea, by the way, was not new to the Romans. The Greeks, for example, believed in the omphalos, that is the navel of the universe. And they had sites throughout the Greek world where they believed was the kind of the, the cosmogonic, the place of origin for the people or for this tribe or for that village, etc. So the Romans borrowed that idea. They shared that idea with lots of other people. So this idea of going underground into a cave and then marking it with a structure was very much a Mediterranean, an ancient idea. So, um, so, there, the, so Rome is a, the, the later city develops, but it continues to understand and appreciate the importance of these ancient sites. And then the, the Roman Forum, as you see here, and by the way, all of that took place to the north at the very end of the Roman Forum, but eventually it will be built up. I noted in one of my earlier diagrams that there was a lake to the south, the southern end of the, uh, of the Roman Forum. Well, that lake actually was right here one, which was later drained, later built up as a palace by the Emperor Nero. That palace was dismantled. And then the Flavian family uh, actually built the Colosseum, this wonderful, um, magnificent amphitheater, which is still today. It's actually being renovated today, restored today, uh, built on the site of that ancient palace, but which was built on the site of an ancient uh, lake. So Rome is like uh, what historians will call a palimpsest, that is layer upon layer upon layer upon layer uh, built up over many, many, many centuries. So I want to end by, by showing you a couple of uh, maps, uh, again, highlighting though at its apogee, when the city was in fact uh, at the fully functional capital city in the third and fourth century, the third third and fourth centuries, um, how built up, how densely built up it was. So again, just to kind of orient you, here is uh, the Capitoline Hill, and next to it is the, uh, is the uh, 
uh, the Palatine Hill, and in the middle of it is the Roman Forum. And what I wanted to point out was how these hills and the, uh, particularly the Capitoline and the Palatine were fed by aqueducts that brought fresh water in. And these are uh, color coded so that you can actually see that what is in orange and red here, the Aqua Claudia uh, is actually bringing in water to, directly to the, uh, the Roman, um, the palaces, the palace of the Roman emperors, but also to these baths. And what you see here in black are these incredible structures. These were gigantic monuments filled with art, but also filled with, uh, with um, uh, gymnasia, spaces for people to relax. Sometimes they had libraries. These were places where the Romans took care of the, both their bodies and their minds. So these baths were often the gifts of Roman emperors to the Roman people who were assiduously clean and who bathed every day and often twice a day. And they used these baths and those baths were um, hot water, cold water, tepid water. Um, they, those baths provided these amenities, these public civic amenities. And those were fed by these aqueducts that brought in fresh water, clean water from the mountains surrounding the, the city. And then, of course, all that the used water would be dumped into the Tiber River, which would then flow out into the Tyranian Sea, to the Mediterranean. Uh, notice also here in brown the, the massive set of walls. And there was a whole series of walls. These aqueducts and roads had to penetrate those walls, pinch points, to, uh, 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 that uh, the walls protected the city. And then the, the ways in and out were through major gates, major doorways, allowing you into the city proper. Uh, this is just, uh, I want to end by showing you a model that was built by a classifying a few years ago, showing us, in fact, um, the, the, the beauty of what was once the city. What's, what, and and you, actually, what's wonderful about this model is my students built the topography of the city. There's the Tiber there on the, uh, at the upper end of your screen with its monuments in the Forum Boarium. And then here you see the Roman Forum and the major hills, the Capitoline, the Palatine, and the other hills. So it gives you a sense of how these hills converge on the Roman Forum. And then they just built the monuments. They didn't build all the every single little Roman house. They just built the important structures on that monument, including the Roman, uh, the Colosseum, the Flavian Amphitheater, um, the major Roman fora, the major temples, etc. But they also highlighted the roads that came and converged on the Roman Forum. And here you see them piecing this model together at the University of Montana a few years ago, building it, photographing it. Uh, understanding that Rome was a very, very complex place um, and it took thousands of people, millions of people working in concert under the leadership of the Roman state uh, and the Caesars to pull this thing together. So we'll end here. I will stop my share at this point and we will pick up the conversation of the development of the Roman Republic at our next gathering. Thank you very much.